Now, I want you to um, listen to this, and you know, I believe that this was uh, today <laughs> was just it was feared. I think today's eleventh hour was feared by the enemy. Now, I want to read you first of all this prophetic word that the Lord gave me. And he said this. He said, the next move is God's in this whole political thing. The next move is God's. We must remember this. The next move is God's concerning Trump, Biden, uh, the whole thing. The Lord had told me, and I said it on October the 10th, that he was giving governments, especially D.C., 30 days to repent. And then, of course, the Lord said they didn't take it. Now, I want you to listen to this. The mindset of a warrior is a mindset of persevere, to persevere. That is the mindset of a warrior. A mind to take a prophetic word and persevere with it. You're in battle. You're in the, in, you're in the battle of two prophecies right now. See, the enemy is not a prophet, but he was prophetic, and he knows the power in the prophetic. He knows what it will do. You have to remember in the very beginning, before man was ever created, that he anointed this one cherub. His name was Lucifer. Now, Lucifer was known as the son of the morning. Jesus is known as the bright and morning star. And just like all of you have, a, have an angel, uh, when you're born, there's an angel assigned to you. Imagine all the babies that have been aborted and their angel went back to heaven with them. And they, they never even got the opportunity because their angel was overrode by the mindset of a human. Which goes to show you something. Angels can't just come and do what they want to do. There is a scripture where it tells husbands and wives, don't argue, don't fight, don't do these things because of the angels. There should be order in your home because of the angels. In other words, the angels can't do anything to help you if your home is just out of order and chaotic. They just stand back and fold their wings, you know, and it's like, oh, God, oh, God, why do they do it? Why do they do that? That's why confusion, strife, all of that has to be guarded at all cost. Now, the angelic world knows how this works, and Satan knows that if he can stir it up in your life, that he can't, the, the, the Lord can't get you the host to protect and help you. They can't get to you. They can't do anything for you. Because you're in a hole swimming in a pool of strife. And so he'll get you in strife about anything. It don't matter what it is. Anything, just as long as you can get you in strife. So when you start knowing these things, you have to remember. See, Satan knows he was Lucifer, the light bearer. What that means is that he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Ezekiel uh, 28 talks about these stones of fire. And what that is, is it's, a, it's revelations from God. It's revelation knowledge. It's revelations. They're fire. They're burning with the, with the fiery revelations of God. And before there was a man to carry the revelation, then all these revelations to prepare the earth for God's family to come was in something that the Bible calls the stones of fire. And Lucifer was allowed to walk up and down in the midst of those stones, and he was looking for revelation. And he was a musician. He, he, was a, he actually was an instrument himself. Instead of a heart, he had a tambourine that would beat. A timbrel was built in him. He had, he had pipes that came out of his being, and the wind of the Spirit would blow through those pipes, and he would, be, he would take the way you hear us stand here and suddenly start singing these revelations that we hear or see. 
then he would walk up and down in the stones of fire, see a revelation, take it within himself, and he would lift himself up to the center of the earth, and he would begin to sing the revelation. The beat, the rhythm of life would come and he would connect with the rhythm of the earth and he would begin to beat and the frequencies would start sounding and everything in the creation has a frequency and it would uh, suddenly, it would start to mingle and match the frequencies and, and, and it would move things around. The power of God would start moving things around through the prophetic song that Lucifer would sing. And Jeremiah 4 says that it was, it was the earth, there was a, the fruitful places because they became a wilderness. And, and the cities were built. There were cities built. But yet there was no man, Jeremiah 4 says. This was all before a man. And then the day came when Lucifer came and walked up and down in the stones of fire, the son of the morning. He, he was Jesus' personal angel. And he came and walked up and down. And that's why people pit the two against each other. Have you ever noticed that? They'll talk about Jesus because everyone really knows he's God. And then they'll try to pit the devil and put him on the same level as him. He was never on the same level as him. And the punk angel now surely ain't on the same, even close to his shoes. Matter of fact, he's under his shoes. And so, but, but that's why there are, because that was his personal angel, the way you have one. And he rebelled. And that's why he had to face him on the Mount of Temptation. Oh, um, uh, the scripture talks about a man rises or falls to his own master. That's a spiritual law. And Lucifer had to rise and fall against Jesus himself because that's his master. And he beat him before and he beat him after he became a man. He beat him both places. Now, then he went into hell and beat him completely when he rose from the dead. Now, so he's walking up and down in the stones of fire, taking these revelations, putting them within his being, lifting himself up and begin to sing and the rhythms of life and the frequencies of God would begin to come out into the earth and it would match frequencies of, of mountains, rocks and things and it could even move them around because if you could match the frequency of something and the way it vibrates, it'll actually pick it up and move it. He would begin to prepare the earth for God's family. But he didn't really know exactly what he was doing until he walked up and down in those stones of fire and the revelation of the man, probably the brightest one there, flashed up into him. And he saw what a man was. He saw he was in the image of God. He saw that he was made a little lower than God. And he saw that everything that God had created with his hands, the sun, the moon, the stars, was given under his dominion. Everything in the jet streams of the oceans were given under the man's dominion. Everything was going to be given to him. And it filled him with violence. And that was the eighth psalm, was a protest in the courts of heaven. That's what that is. David being a prophet heard it, told it, and Hebrews 2 quotes it again and reveals to us that it was a certain angel talking. And in the Greek it says he testified. It says he earnestly protested. He was in the court of heaven. And so he understands the power of the prophetic word. When the prophetic word can be taken inside you and the prophetic word can be heard as something from the mind of God, a revelation coming from the mind of the Almighty dropped down inside your spirit, it absolutely will change your whole perception of everything in existence. It will change everything when you know that you are, you know who he is and that he knows who you are. And he talks to you in revelation. Revelation of his word, the stones of fire. And so when he, he, he began to see that, he rebelled. But he knew the power of the prophetic word. And he tried to use the prophetic word. 
when he saw that man was going to be able to take God's word, listen close to what I'm telling you now, to take God's word, put it in your heart, speak it out of your mouth, and when it can't, comes out of your mouth, the Bible talks about the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. This is a two-edged blade. What does that mean? It means it goes in one-edged, and when you release it out of your mouth, it comes out double-edged. And it can cut its way out of anything. It can do anything. And when it becomes a revelation inside you, and God has talked to you the way he did Peter that day, when Jesus was standing there and said, but who do you say I am? Some said, well, some say you're Jeremiah, one of the prophets. You're, you're this, you're that. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ the son of the living God. And it probably lit Peter up, man. I mean, it probably, that, that man probably lit him up, as we say. Because it was a fresh stone of fire came right into his spirit and his mind. And when he did, Jesus got all excited. Jesus gets excited when he hears revelation spoken to him. <laughs> he gets all he gets all excited when you start talking like him. When you get a revelation and you start proclaiming that revelation, it it really gets him excited. He looked at Peter and he said, "Flesh and blood didn't tell you that." He said, "My Father in heaven told you that." Oh man, Peter had heard the Father in heaven personally commune with him. Where was Peter that day? Think about it. Where was he that day? He was following the word so close. Jesus, the word, he was following it so close. He no doubt was meditating on all the scriptures that prove he's the Messiah, that talks about him that was coming. He's talking about all this. His mind is on the revelations that the prophets had spoke of all those years and eons of time. And suddenly, God talked to him. And when he did, Jesus got excited. So the prophetic word, the enemy knows the power of the prophetic word. He knows that power. And he fears that power. Now, if you look at Isaiah 14, you'll see what he tried to do. Now, let's look at that right quick. Isaiah 14, 14th chapter. Now, watch this. He says this. In verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, light bearer, you who was bearing the light of God from the stones of fire, son of the morning, the personal angel of the Messiah? How art you, have thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Said, you weakened the nations, for you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. In other words, he never said I'll be God. He said I want to be like him. He's describing the authority of a man that he found in that revelation. And he said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. He started trying to speak the prophetic word. He started trying to speak it for himself. He was only an anointed cherub, anointed to sing it. And anointed to bring forth frequencies that the earth could get in tune with. So he's, so he was answered, verse 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms? So now he's already jumped ahead to the Antichrist. In other words, this will be where he tries to make that prophecy happen. He wants to be a man like the Most High, the image and likeness, you, you, me, the image and likeness of the Most High. Now, so now we're looking at two prophecies, and 
these are the prophecies given. There's a prophecy given about or given to and about the enemy and about the earth, the church and the nations. The prophecy to the enemy is found in Genesis 3 right off when the Lord himself looked at the enemy and said, the seed of the woman's coming and her seed will uh, bruise the head of your seed and your seed will bruise his heel. So he's talking about the crucifixion where he will be defeated. Well, it happened. And that prophecy took place. And that was a prophecy that the enemy guarded against for so long. Every time he thought he had it maybe eluded, he had it out of the way, he had it somewhere, it would show up in a shadow. Oh, yes. Goliath. Have you ever noticed where the stone hit him? In the head. It's always in the head. It's always started to show up. The shadow of the cross would show up all along history. Now, the enemy constantly fights this because the first is fulfilled. It was fulfilled at the resurrection and the seating of the Son of Man, the Messiah, at the right hand of God the Father. Seated at the right hand of God the Father, sitting on the mercy seat. Now the second prophecy coming, he knows it also. And I want to say something that's going to sound strange to you. And Satan's whole ministry is to stop it. See, he's Angels are ministering spirits set forth to minister for those who shall be the heirs of salvation. This fallen angel, this punk angel, is still a minister. But he's a, he's a minister of demonic hordes. And he ministers to evil men. And he ministers to dictators. He ministers to one right now that's sitting, uh, claiming to sit in the seat of Donald Trump. And when this one starts whispering, gets down, look close at his eye. It slotted the pupil. A lot of times it's slotted. And his mouth looks like a serpent. And he'll begin to talk. And then it'll leave him and he'll just do something else. But this thing, this, the, his whole ministry now is to stop the prophecy that God gave Moses. The prophecy he gave Moses was this. When God said the children of Israel were so rebellious, they were in the desert. All they ever said is we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And they actually got what they said later. All of those 20 years old and, and up was the only ones, uh, I mean, those died in the wilderness. And so they kept talking, uh, you know, like that. And then finally, and every time they turned around, they were rebelling. They were always against God's prophet. And every time they turned around, then the Lord finally said, the Lord, God in his system of harvest, he said, told Moses, move out of the way. Because Moses was in his face praying for them. Move out of the way. I'm going to go up through the middle of them and just kill them all. They'll all die. I'll consume them. And I'll start over with you. Now, something is very strange right there. I'll start over with you. Because Moses said, no, Lord, they'll just say you brought them out in the wilderness to kill them. And Moses became the mediator between them and God and their bad harvest. That's why he's compared to Jesus. He, he gave his self for them. That's why he didn't enter the promised land. Now watch this. And so there, and he, but he disobeyed. The Messiah did not. Now watch this. So he, he says, no, Lord, they'll just say you brought them out here to kill them. Then he says this. He said, all right, all right, 
I'll spare them. But he said, as I live, my glory will fill this earth. Whoa. That tells you and me that he planned on that happening then. It was going to happen then, and a rebellious, stiff-necked people stood in his way. He was going to bring it to pass starting over with Moses because Moses would stand in his glory. Moses had said, show me your glory. That's what Moses wanted to know. He could have started over with him. And I'm going to tell you something. Don't tell me God couldn't have gave Moses children. He could have gave him children just like that. He, I mean, he could have gave him so many. And let me tell you something else too. He could have brought the glory within a matter of hours through him. Oh, yes, he could. John the Baptist said this. Don't say we have uh, Abraham as our father, telling the Pharisees. He said, God's able to raise up from these stones children to Abraham. So there was plenty of stones out there. He could have done it all right there in a matter of hours. All he had to done is had Moses start talking to stones, speaking to stones. Are you listening to me? So we, we have to understand something that he said, as sure, my glory will fill this earth. So his, the enemy's ministry to this day is to stop the glory from filling the earth. He couldn't stop the crucifixion, the bruising of the enemy's head, but now he's wanting to stop the glory from coming into the earth. If he can stop the glory from coming into the earth, he'll stop the resurrection power because glory is resurrection power. He'll stop you from becoming what God has told you he, you would be. And believe this or not, I don't care what people tell you, America plays a pivotal part in this. And the glory coming. Israel plays a pivotal role in it coming. And now all the born-again people and all the nations around the earth play a pivotal role in its coming. And the enemy is trying everything he can to keep that glory from coming. If you think all of this is going to change before they attack the church, you're wrong. They're going to attack God's people soon. They tried it when they tried to get the church deemed non-essential. But nobody could really get it going. Except the churches that, that really didn't believe. And had already conformed. But they, they tried to call it non-essential. Uh, non it's not essential. And they're going to try to keep pushing this thing, pushing this thing, pushing this thing. But I'm going to tell you something, repeating a prophecy that God gave Moses. As the Lord lives, his glory will fill this earth. And if you're in this earth, then you have the potential of seeing the glory where you are. Hallelujah. So... The ministry of the fallen ministering spirit is to minister to these wicked jackals. He ministers to the wicked jackal of Biden, Harris. The whole Democrat party is the, is the spirit of Og. It's the spirit of Og. You have tech giants, and one just fell on his Facebook and pronounced himself dead. In a Hebrew word. So you have to, uh, meta. So you have to start seeing these things. The, uh, the second's coming soon. The enemy knows it. His whole ministry is to stop this from happening. Uh, America's part of the prophecy. Certainly Israel's part of the prophecy. The nations are involved. This is the mystery of the eagle, the ox, the lion, and the man. I, don't, I, I guess that's all I can say about that right now. But it's the mystery of those four faces that go around God's throne. The eagle, the ox, the lion, and the man. These are being revealed now. Other creatures in this earth as the bear, the dragon, the serpent, different ones are doing battle against it. 
Hallelujah. Okay. The Democrat Party is Og. And all of them are in direct opposition against the prophecy to stop the glory from coming. But they have, now listen close to what I'm going to say. But they have pushed not just the nation, but the world into the third stage of subversion, the crisis mode. You know, I'm, being, I'm, I'm starting to hear this more and more now. People are talking about the art of war. I've, I've heard it, and I, I really didn't hear anybody talking about it until I heard about it way back, and now it seems like people are talking about it. I was listening to an old recording of JFK talking to one of the generals. I think it was Eisenhower, and he was talking to him, and you could sit there and listen to them talk on this old recording. And he was talking about how the Soviets, if they continued in their subvers subversion tactics, he understood that. And so that might be why he's not here. But I'm going to tell you something. In the third stage, subversion is the art of war. Uh, I, 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 I'm one day I'm going to learn how to say this guy's name right. It's either Sun Say or Sun Su or something. I asked somebody in Idaho in a crowd the other night. I said, the art of war. Who wrote the art of war? Sun, and they gave me three different names. I said, see, nobody really knows how to pronounce that. And so I just stuck with my own. But he, he was a, an advisor in about 3,000, 3,500 years ago to the Chinese dynasty. And he came up with a plan to win a nation, to take a nation without ever shedding blood. And he said the, the best way to win a war is to never have to fight the war. And he said it's done in four stages. One is demoralization. It's when you take people into that nation and you start, you want them to be your nation. So you come in with your professors, your teachers, your people, and you come in and it takes, and you start to brainwash generations with your teaching. And he said, you have to ease it in there. See, it has to be done without any resistance at all. Everybody, you need to really listen to this because I'm not going to take a long time with it, but I want you to hear it. So he, he says it, the first stage takes 15 to 20 years because you have to have at least three educated generations so that the third one comes out completely demoralized, demoralized of what they believed in freedom. Now they only believe what you, you believe in your nation. And then after that, you bring them out and you start putting those graduates into the, uh, control of media, into government, into high-ranking positions. And they say once a generation is demoralized, you could show them the truth. You could hand them a piece of paper written in black and white to tell them every truth, every fact, and they still wouldn't believe it. They said you could show it to them. And I remember one de uh, man who defected from the Soviet Union who was an expert in ideological warfare. He said you could take them to a Soviet concentration camp in those days to a Soviet concentration camp, show them what you're saying is true, and they still can't see it because they're brainwashed, completely demoralized. That's why you look at liberal media, liberal news, all these people, and they just look at you with their head tilted and this nowhere look on their face, this far off look, like they don't even understand, you know, how to eat peanut butter. They just, they just look off. And you can tell them that killing 345,000 unborn a year is not right, and they just look at you with their eyes glazed over. And the man from the Soviet Union that defected here in, the seven, in 1970, he said this, uh, in the 70s, he said, he said, by that time, he said, there's nothing you can do to tell them any different. They're lost. And so then you put those kind of people in control, carrying the subversion nation, the ones who's subverting, carrying their ideologies into this nation. And now you've unleashed a whole generation of people 
that are running the government that think like that. It's in his book. Just look at it. It's in his book. He dedicates it to the greatest radical of all, Lucifer. Man, he didn't really mean it. Then he should have, he should have dedicated it to Daffy Duck or something. But he, he dedicated it to Lucifer himself who rebelled against heaven. I don't tell you what they're about. Then that takes about five years. And how do you know when you've been in, and that's called the destabilization mode of subversion. The demoralized generation is empowering the destabilization of the nation. How do you know when that's happened? They start rioting. Then policemen become the enemy. All authority becomes their enemy. And they do all these things. And they'll use any group that has a movement. Any group that has a movement. Man, we have so many groups now. We got groups that fight to let men go in the bathroom with your little girls because they identify as some kind of little girl, I guess. And so the government trying to uphold that. Donald Trump said, that's not right. And they said, oh, my God, he is, a, he is against freedom. No, he's against child molestation. That might work a lot of places, but I'm going to tell you something, Hoss. That won't work in the South. I know some sixth graders around here drag you out by your ear, probably. I mean, these, these guys down here, I, I may be exaggerating a little, but I went to school with sixth graders, was this tall, man. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. You don't, you don't do that down here. Some old boy drive up in a jacked-up four-wheel drive truck, and he'll show you real quick what bathroom to go into. But this is part of the destabilization of the nation. You know what? The man who defected, who taught us what the Soviets was trying to do, and Kennedy obviously knew it. Because he talked about an evil, a wickedness. And it was amazing because he was a Democrat. And he talked about what he was going to do, and, they, and he comes up dead going to do to stop it and to stop things. But he used the word subversion. He dealt with the Soviets. He dealt with all of this stuff. Well, the man who defected, who revealed all this to us, said this. He said, what do they do with all those groups when they, when they finally subvert the nation and they're in control? He said, what do they do with all of them? He said, they shoot them. He said, they just shoot them. Because they don't need anybody destabilizing anything now. So the third stage, that's uh, first is 15, 20 years. Second's five years, uh, five to six years. The third stage is called crisis mode. Crisis is when you've pushed the nation up to the edge and you've got such a crisis going on that it's about to get shoved over the edge. And this is what he said. He said, once a nation gets to crisis mode, there's no coming back. He said, if it ever makes it into crisis mode, you can't get it back. He said, there's only two things that will bring it back from a crisis mode. And that is um, a civil war or a foreign invasion. And, you know, that's why we went into Grenada, because Grenada had been subverted and it was in the crisis mode. We had to go in there as a nation and stop it. We were the foreign government that invaded or they would have never came back. And so that's happened, you know, in different nations so many times. And then the th fourth stage is, is normalization. And, that, and crisis only takes about six months after the nation's destabilized. So then the final stage comes in, and it's an indefinite period of time. It's called normalization. When uh, Comrade Brezhnev uh, took over Czechoslovakia and so forth, he said, brotherly Czechoslovakia has now been normalized when Soviet tanks rolled down their streets. And so at that point, they get rid of all the radicals, every movement, women's live, homosexual movement, Black Lives Matter, uh, Antifa, no matter what they were, they just get rid of them because they don't need them in the normalization stage because they could hurt them. 
Now, you just think about all this. And so you start looking at it, and you start looking through the Scripture, and you find out Satan uses these tactics. He uses these tactics, and he uses spirits called principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places to assist in these tactics. Now, at this moment in time, it's not just the U.S. that's in the third stage trying to push it into the third stage because this is something to bring about world domination and world control. And the four stages of the enemy, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, which works with demoralization, destabilization, crisis, and normalization, which he uses, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places, uses all of this together. These are the spirits in the book of Revelation that overthrow nations. Now it's not just the U.S. They are, are pushing for world domination for the Antichrist, the Bible speaks of, for one day to come, and they, they're going to push it toward this agenda, and that's what these spirits are doing to bring about, I will be like the Most High. Yeah, right. And to stop the glory. Surely somebody can see this now. I mean, are we getting this? Is everybody getting this? Okay. Okay. If you're not getting it yet and you, you're doing like this, uh, uh, just jump up and down a little bit and shake it all down. Hallelujah. We got to get this. You know I'm picking at you, but I'm, I'm trying to get this across to everybody. So then you have, and now we realize the world is being subverted. It's the world governments bringing in, watch, a one world government. Government. What is a one world government? It's one government that all of them think alike. Like at the Tower of Babel. So where are we now in the world? He's tried to push the world into crisis mode. Crisis mode. The whole world. Now, but by doing this, by pushing the world into crisis mode, you can tell where he's, what he's trying to do. He tried to throw the world into a crisis mode with the ship that got lodged in the Suez. Backed up over 300 ships, barges. I'm not talking about a couple rowboats with a couple cases of popcorn on each one of them. We're talking about barges with thousands and thousands and thousands of containers of food and supply. And they backed it up at the Suez and said, oh, we're going to have, we, we may have to send it around the Horn of Africa, which is going to delay so much time. It's going to, halt. okay, all this is going to happen. It will throw the world into a shortage crisis. But before it happened, I heard them talk about it. I heard in the Spirit and I told it before it ever happened, uh, and, uh, and I started talking about it. I said, uh, and the Lord, I didn't even really know what I was hearing. And the Lord said, you heard a conversation. You heard the plans in the bedchamber. See, the Scripture says in Ecclesiastes, I don't know if, if people, uh, even a lot of people don't even know that Scripture's in the Bible. Uh, our partners know. Oh, they know. They know. Let's, let's just see if we can find it. I'd just like to find it and read it to you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, my pages are sticking together here. I'm trying to do this before we, we don't want to run out of time here. Uh, Ecclesiastes 10.20, Curse not the king, know not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and he that hath wings shall tell the matter. And so they were discussing throwing the world into a, a crisis. And if you remember, I said it's going to involve shipping. It's going to be this. It's going to be all kinds of shipping. It's going to have to do with food and all of this. And the Lord said, if they're allowed to do it in 2021, they will do it in 2030, and it'd be irreversible. 
said what they decide to do in 2030 will not be able to be reversed. In other words, full crisis mode. There's no coming back. And so I sent a word out from this podium to the right people, and I said, just listen to this, and I told them what I heard way before it happened. And then the morning it happened, the Lord told me again, and I said, there's a miracle in the ship. You'll see this miracle. In other words, it's going to happen, but it's going to be a miracle involved too. And when it happened, then that evening that ship got stuck, and all those containers got backed up out in the uh, you know, the Red Sea and out in the different seas. And I was all out there and they couldn't, nobody get supply. And they thought for sure they had it. Crisis mode. We'll make it in 2021 and there's no way to reverse it. And all of a sudden, miracle, boom, the ship un unlodged and started moving. And couldn't you see the devil? He starts kicking the ground. What happened? Angels got involved. What happened? The prophetic word was spoken. What happened? The plans of the enemy in the bedchamber was seen, heard, and revealed, and suddenly we, we won't even know probably until we get to heaven one day all that was involved in freeing that ship and all that was involved in lodging it. I'm almost done here. And then, and then, so that didn't happen. So they've got to come up with something else. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, let's see, what are we going to do? Oh, well, we've got this COVID thing going, and everybody's scared out of their mind over COVID. So let's just, uh, uh, let's start in on this vaccination thing. We'll get them all vaccinated, and then, then they have to take it. We're going to make that mandatory. Oh, whoa, whoa, but that's not working. People are not going to let you come in their homes, drag them out and stick a needle in their arm, especially in America and especially in the South. And so here they are and all of this is happening. They got this crisis going, but they can only get the nation so much vaccinated. The rest of it won't do it. And they got to do it in America because everybody else will follow in the free world. So, but they can't get it going. So what do they do? Well, we got to have more of a crisis now. Hmm. I tell you what we'll do. Let's back up all the ships off the coast of California. And we'll start this shipping crisis again. But the Lord told me that it was coming again. Remember? Before it ever happened. How do you, how you know all that's coming every time like that? Well, as far as these ships go, it's this verse right here. You shouldn't have never cursed the kings and your, and your thought or in, uh, curse uh, the rich in your bedchamber. Because an angel picked up your voice and told me. And I used this podium and told it. Well, you know, brother. Yes, I know. And so, and so now they're off the coast of California. And they say, well, we can't unload it because there's not enough dock workers to unload the barges. Really. Just put out the word to the citizens that don't have anything. They'll unload it. They'll come out there and unload it. Some of those dock workers in retirement will unretire and come do it. You know what was that? But somebody was showing there's a meme out now about Black Friday. Black Friday shopping and on jet skis headed toward those barges out there. <laughs> you know. So they know, see, they're still trying in 2021. If they can't get the crisis of shortage started in 2021, they'll never be able to do it in 2030. It'll never happen in 2030. Hallelujah. Now, so, but by trying to subvert the world this time, you know what we used to say? This is something that, that, that I used to say, you know, I, I used in a song one time. They've thrown their loop too wide this time. You know, they talk about if you're going to rope cattle, don't throw your loop too wide. And if you're going to try to take in more land, you know, don't throw your loop too wide. You know, when Saddam Hussein did what he did in Kuwait and all of that, he had to deal with America. And I did a song called This Ain't Our First Rodeo. And, I, and then it said, before you throw your loop too wide, you need to remember something. This ain't our first rodeo. And so Satan threw his loop too wide this time. 
And all of this is going on. They've got, think about it, they've got COVID. They've got, that didn't work, so they added variants. And it just keeps adding variants. See, the variants are unlimited. So then they got COVID, they got variants, they got this, they got that. But on the world a meter of real-time deaths, COVID, you can't even hardly find it. And when you find it, it's the least amount of killing, and the numbers are not even clicking. They don't want you to know that. But abortion is at 35 million worldwide this year. So here it is. So he threw his loop too wide. He tried to throw the world into a crisis mode because he knows his time is short. But... Hallelujah.